listen to the vibes. The views and opinions of our guests may not necessarily reflect those of the host or the Vibes Broadcast Network. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Listen to the Vibes. And I'm very excited and very privileged to have the one and only Mr. Daryl Way here with me. And he is a <laughs> violinist. And well, you played with what, Jethro Tull and a few other bands along the way. Well, my band was Curved Air, um, which was uh, in the, the late 60s, early 70s. We, we basically toured around America, 71, 72, 73. Um, we were in the support act in those days. We supported Jethro Tull and Emerson Lake and Palmer and Deep Purple. But we did um, we did three tours of America. Um, unfortunately, we didn't. I don't think I don't think we quite cracked America. But in in, in England, because we were a prog rock band. Um, we were pretty big. We were the sort of flavor of the um, of the year, shall we say? If not, if flavor of the month, if not the year, let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have a new album coming out, and I did listen to it, and I I, I wrote a few notes down because I wanted to talk about some of the songs. But before we get into that, just tell us a little bit more about yourself. Uh, well, um, I was a classically classically trained violinist, uh, studied at the Royal College of Music. And I was living in London, at, you know, during the late 60s. I was at college then in London at the Royal College. And, um, you know, I got swept up by the, uh, by the music scene, you know, the, the vibrant music scene in London at that time. I mean, that's, that's, London was happening in 67, 68, 69 musically. And um, I got um, kind of beguiled by the rock music scene. And I, I, I basically dropped my studies and I, I, I decided to go into rock music because it seemed to me that it was a really happening um, uh, an art. It was be turning into an art form, you know. After the Beatles, um, uh, Sergeant Pepper's, yeah. it, it gave it it gave um, new, uh, popular or rock music. It, it gave it a, a valid a validity validity. Hard to say that word. Um, and I, I kind of felt well, we all felt in the band curved air. I was worked with a, another classical musician called Francis Monk, Monkman, who was studying harpsichord at the, um, at the Royal Academy of Music. And um, we really felt that it was, it was a viable art form. And this was something that we could express ourselves in. And um, it was very exciting times, I have to say, because it was, it was the time of experimentation and trying out new ideas of the early days of the synthesizer, the early days of all the, all the different sounds you could get from the guitar and, um, sound, sound pedals, etc. So it was a wonderful time to be around in, in rock music, if not in music. Yeah. Well, I've, I've interviewed a few musicians uh, that uh, are with the same PR firm that you are, and the the sound is like Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, and Yes, and Pink Floyd. All that's coming back. And, uh, I, oh, good! I, I'd like to hear that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really, there, I, you know, some Frank Zappa kind of thrown in there, and Captain. Oh, Bart. Frank! Yeah, that's... yeah. I kind of rediscovered Frank Zappa recently. There was a program on television, and um, I'd forgotten what a genius that guy was. Um, you know, he was, you know, a, a completely accomplished musician. He could put the music down onto paper straight from his head, from his noodle, and that's quite a skill. And, you know, he would write the stuff, you know, you think about it, he'd write it in his head and then he would put it straight down onto paper. And his, you know, the way he put it down, it was absolutely beautifully written. It's almost, it's almost like Mozart in its scale. Oh. And um, he was an absolute, the stuff he was doing was so far ahead of its time. Well, you know, a lot of the bands, they, they know like three chords <laughs> and that's mm -hmm. about the extent of the music. And there's some good solos and stuff, but, it's it's nothing like progressive rock no um, you get the classics and you get you get rock you get some jazz i mean all this stuff is combined it's absolutely beautiful music it and is the album that that you just put or is fixed to be released um i i was privileged enough to get to hear it ahead of time yeah. and and i i love every track on there oh that's really sweet that's very, very gratifying, Carl. That's very nice to know. 
I was just going back to Frank Zappa. The other thing I've, was, uh, that came across in this program, which I was really surprised about, I didn't know, was the fact that the band and himself, they were dry. They didn't touch drugs or booze. Mm -hmm. They were That's a completely right. a sober band. And yet it had this kind of crazy image. And you think they've got to be stoners. Frank Zappa has got to be a stoner, but he wasn't. <laughs> Yeah, especially some of the lyrics he came up with. <laughs> Quite, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yes, we won't go into that because <laughs> it's probably X-rated. <laughs> and I mean, who ever thought of mixing reggae and fifties doo wop together? But Frank Zappa, you know, <laughs> he did. Yeah. And also, the stuff was fiendishly difficult to play as well. All those xylophone runs were just incredibly difficult. Oh. And, and you know he was never satisfied with the band he was always switching people out but that was all right because he wanted a specific sound and if you didn't make that sound he was finding somebody else who would right. <laughs> <laughs> well i told you i i've written down some notes and i want okay. to talk about each song um there was the, the first track which was called life and it's it's almost like a you're going into a religious experience when you're listening to it right what was your feelings when you were writing that well i've got to be careful here because the the album is is, is actually a fictional album that's connected with the novel which right. is a fictional a fictional novel it's a it's a work of fiction so the um when i talk about this i have to talk talk about it on behalf of Daniel and as a producer and curator of the project, mm -hmm. because um, the, the album is a very big part of, of, of the actual novel. Uh, and to give away any kind of uh, spoilers, it's a bit of a spoiler, look, but what I can tell you that, yes, that I can, uh, on behalf of Daniel, who wrote the song, mm -hmm. it, the fictional Daniel Luckham, um, it, this, you know, life is, is, is basically a song about uh, the fact is that no matter what we do, we're not going to come out of this alive. And it's, 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 a, it's, I suppose it's a bit of an old man song, um, but it's, it's meant to be written in the 60s. So Daniel, when he wrote it in the 60s, was, was very, very f advanced for his, age, for his age, shall we say. So it's, it's just a philosophical song that, you know, basically, you know, no matter what you do or how much, how you life has lived it's you're not going to come out of this and you might as well enjoy the ride so it's basically about saying you know life is to be lived and if you can possibly live it do that i have to stress to everyone that uh, this is definitely unique because uh, there is a novel that comes along with it and i know we can't get too much into it right uh, but um the, the text you said that when you're reading it, I guess on Kindle or whatever, you there's highlighted sentences and you can click on it and you can what you get music from it. Yeah, yeah. There's there's um the, there's it's got musical illustrations, which is um uh, which, which is something I thought would be nice to have. And um, you know nowadays with modern technology, you can do that, but it's it's not been done a lot, I have to say. Um, so. When if you come across a title of a song, or whatever, or you you get a clip, you press you press on the underlying title, you'll get a, a clip of that song. Or if you if there's uh, if there's a, a a phrase, I think there's one. There's it it says um, the hero in the book is in in a in a in a CD um, strip club, and the, the the text says that the on the tannoy was tinny jazz music. And so if you press on Tiddy Jazz music, you'll hear the music that he hears in the club. Uh, it's great to see real creativity again, because when you listen to some of the modern music, it, it's uh, got the same formula to it. it. It's like some corporate guy says, oh, this is what's popular. You got to stay to, to this kind of form. And y'all don't do that. No, that, that's what I appreciate about it. Well, the thing is that you know it, it has become formulaic. The music, um, it's it's very very uh, uh, pop pop based nowadays. There's, it doesn't seem to be any experimentation. Well, not that I'm aware of. I'm sure the band there are bands out there, young bands out there that are doing stuff, but they're not being given the opportunity to hit the mainstream or or, or you know to break into the big time. Mm -hmm. um, but you know there are there are bands. I'm absolutely positive, but 
but as you say, it's 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 gone back to the corporate kind of vision of things. Things have to be formulaic, and it's the record companies that are that are dictating what should what the kids should be listening to, and it is pretty much um, a, a, a very very samey samey situation. Yeah. And then we come to Guiding Star. Um, to me, and I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, it's almost like. Pete Floyd meets uh, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer in, in that song. Right. <laughs> Even without sounding like them, it's got no. that feel to it. Well, is it once again? It's a prog rock track, and uh, and it's it's the um, it's it's the ubiquitous anti-war song that would have been written in the '60s because there was a very strong feeling, you know, the anti-war feeling, and uh, because of the Vietnam War. So it was. Um, it was it, it was a, an anti-war song, but it was also an not just necessarily the Vietnam War. It's it's also to do with any any young generation that's been conscripted into into a war, with, you know, that didn't particularly agree with what was going on. So it's 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 about all all conscripts throughout the ages, where the person has been taken away from his family and his loved ones uh, against his will and, and stuck in a terrible situation. Now. This is my take on it, so um, <laughs> I, I hope I'm doing it justice here. Okay, but, yeah, we'll spot on so far. <laughs> the next song is uh, called Sh uh, Chacon. Is that how you say it? Chacon, yeah. Okay. Chacon. Um, you know, being the '60s, you you had the uh, the space race and going to the moon and all that. Right. This was to me like the the. The space age blues, if that makes sense. Right. Um, it's well, like the Chacon. The, Chacon, the Chacon is a Chacon is um, a, a classical uh, term. Actually, it comes from the 17th century, and it was a a Chacon is basically a set of chords that people in the 17th century would improvise over. So it's just a set of chords that repeat itself, just the same as the blues, but it's a slightly different chord sequence. And so, so people would write music on the on a ground. It's called so. It, it, normally, it was called a chicane. And so, you have seven chords, seven eight chords that are repeated, and and each variation is different. And in, in this particular piece, each variation gets bigger and bigger and more exciting and more exciting. Mm -hmm. And in fact, a lot of it is actually taken from Corelli's La Folia. Um, so it is, it's, it's very much based on that. Um, so it was his original piece of music, which has been developed and turned into a rock piece of music. Yeah. Because the, the hero in the book, um, or the protagonist in the book, is a, is a classical musician like myself. Uh, I don't want to draw any comparisons, <laughs> but, he, <laughs> but he, was a, he was a keyboard player. So he, was, um, so he would have been aware of this piece. It's, it's like the rock version of... A, a Bach or a Beethoven piece. Yeah, so that's a, I, I, I love that. Well, um, you know, it's once again, it's, it's, it's echoing. You know, it, Kurt Dev had a piece called Vivaldi, which is based on a piece of Vivaldi, and also um, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer took the classics, and they and they uh, they rocked them up to you know to fantastic success. Um, I'm thinking of Sibelius' Corelia Suite they did, and then they did um, uh, uh, Bernstein's. Uh, uh, America, which was a wonderful, wonderful track. So you can take classical elements and some music, especially Baroque music, suits very well uh, rock music because Baroque music always had a rhythm to it and it had a drive to it. And so it does translate well into rock music. It's You're, you're honoring uh, blues, but you're also honoring the, the classics. I right. love that blend. You're, you're um, it's a great being blend. true to it. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's very, a great, great blend. blend. Yeah. Now we're going to Back on the Road. Back on the Road. Uh, it, it felt like uh, you were getting into a souped up car or something in the beginning of it. Uh, I love the sounds that went with it. I love the music. Um, it's, it's like it's taken me on a trip, and it's almost as if you blended. Emerson Lake and Palmer in Deep Purple. Bit of Deep Purple in there, definitely. Um, uh, yeah, this Back on the Road is once, well, it's just a road song. It's, it's about people, in this, well, 
bands spend most of their time on the road and it's 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 you know the one that well the great road song for me is is can't heat um you know on on the road again again, back, yeah. on, again. i mean that's to me just the archetypal uh road song and of course then you've got steppenwolf uh um the name of the song I'm born to be now. wild born to be wild of course um so it, yeah it's 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 a road song. It's about people on the road, but not necessarily about bands. About anybody who's stuck on the road. You know, they make the living on the road. Truck drivers, um, and the fact that you're away from home all the all the time, and that kind of longing you get, that homesickness, that empty homesickness feeling you get when you want to get back and be with your loved ones, or be with your wife or your girlfriend. It, it reminded me of Highway Star. Highway Star. Oh yeah. And like I say the the music, even though you get that feeling, it it doesn't sound like you copied it. You know what I mean? Oh, thank you very much. I try not to. <laughs> <laughs> and then you got the song Morpheus. Uh, I believe Morpheus had to do with your dreams, something along that line. Um, well, I'm it 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 is. I'm not sure about this, but I think Morpheus is the god of sleep. Mm -hmm. Um. And in the in the novel, um, Daniel Luckham, who's the um, uh, who's the hero of the novel, has has problems sleeping. He's an insomniac, and so this is a song that he wrote about his problems. And we were very lucky to um, uh, get Steve Hogarth of Marillion to come along and sing it for us um, as a guest as a guest artist. And um, it's, it's just been released as a single, although at the moment there's some problem with the distribution, but it should be sorted out in the next couple of days. When you watch a movie and you know how you get to a dream sequence in the movie, yeah. that's that's what it kind of reminded me of. Yeah, so it's, it's meant to be kind of like soporific. I mean, you know, to sort of track, you know, maybe if you were feeling a bit tense and you you wanted to nod off, it's a kind of track you put on. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it's not boring, but it, it, it's kind of like transcendental. It, yeah. it, it's, it's, it's a bit like um, I, the influence, I would say, was a, a, an English band called the Incredible String Band. I don't know if you've heard of them at all. Mm -mm, I haven't heard of them. The Incredible String Band. Well, they were worth checking out, especially the album The Hangman's Beautiful Daughter. And it was the cut. It was the um, it was the album that all the hippies and and the stoners used to listen to in London during the late sixties, and uh, they were very big. But they never they never made the big time. But amongst amongst the um, hippie community, sort of in Nottingham Gate, and I suppose the 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 opposite of that would be in in America it would have been Hyde Ashbury. Mm -hmm. um, but in Nottingham Gate, in that area, that the incredible string band is what people used to listen to because it was very, very, very trippy music, and it suited the mood and it kept everybody very calm, <laughs> and kept everybody focused. Mm -hmm. So and uh, so that was the kind of that was the kind of effect that I was you know that we were trying to uh, create in that particular track. A traveler, which again, it kind of reminds me of Pink Floyd in a way. And it's only because, and not the sound, it's just the, the way it kind of starts off and you feel kind of laid back and relaxed. And then all of a sudden you get to this part that kind of wakes you up and then it takes you back to relaxing again. Yeah, travel is, um, traveler, back on road, traveler. Traveler is, um, Traveller is is basically about our once again about our journey through life. It's it's this is another philosophical perhaps um, reflection on it, um, and the fact that we're we're basically no matter you know how close we are to other people, we we do it on our own, um, and at some point or other we'll have to leave them. Uh, so it's 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 quite a a morbid song in in, in some ways, but it's hopefully that it comes across as being a little bit optimistic but it, it is about it is about the the journey through life and it also reflects uh, some things that happen to daniel in the novel uh, because he has a pretty bumpy ride of it um certainly well, certainly half of the half of the time he's having a difficult time um so traveler does reflect that that journey that happens in the novel Time machine. 
This is a, a song that I have to say, if you have to really listen to it. And it took me a, a, a little bit to kind of get a feeling off of it. Get it, yeah, get a handle it because it's in odd rhythms. Yeah, um, it, it's almost makes me think of uh, a, like a, a ballet in a way, but you're you're reaching for something. It's like yeah. you're kind of going back and forth like this, and you, there's knowledge out there you need to pick or something. But you're you're going here, there, and there. Oh, look, there's an apple. I'm going to pull this apple off the tree. <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah, it's it's it's. It's a it's a track that's been that was done in odd rhythms. Um, it's got thirteen eights and seven fours, and um, it, you know it, during the the sixties there was there's a couple of tracks that were actually um, big hits that were in odd rhythms. There was uh, Jeff Hotel's Living in the Past that was in five four, and then of course you've got Dave Brubick um, Take Five, which is also in five. But also um, all you needed love is 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 a seven there's a seven four bar in that. There's a 7 4 section. So the Beatles were using odd rhythms and it just pushes things on in a slightly different way. And it, 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 it doesn't make you feel comfortable. It just makes you sort of, oh, there's something different going on. Um, and of course, most famously, Mike Oldfield uh, used that technique when he did tubular bells because of, all those were odd rhythms. So it, although it's repeated music, your brain can't really catch on to it because the um, uh, there's a there's a, there's a missing beat somewhere, and you, what you're expecting doesn't happen, and that's the beauty of of a of an odd rhythm. It just throws the listener out a little bit, but the the trick is not to throw the listener out as too much that he doesn't understand what's going on. But I, whether I've achieved that or whether we've achieved it or whether Daniel achieved it, that's another thing. Yeah. It's it's almost a little bit of chaos when the song is playing. Uh, I, I hope I'm being respectful there, but um, <laughs> not not that it's. I'm not saying it's a bad song. What I'm saying is um, almost like you're almost not comfortable in a way, but yeah, you're enjoying yeah. the music. And then you come into the next track, which is "Here We Go," and you right. know, it's, it's almost like you're brought back in again. Yeah. Well, here we go. Is um, is it's, it's, it's a bit like. Um, I kind of think that there was a lovely track by Spencer Davis called Here We Go Around the Mulberry Bush. I don't know if you can remember that. I remember Spencer Davis very well. Yeah. Um, and it was, it, was, it was a soundtrack to a movie. I think the movie was called Here We Go Around the Mulberry Bush. And it's just that kind of feel about it, that kind of 60s feel um, that, you know, that, that, that's, that's, it's, it's about kind of like a, uh, a, fu a fun fair that you get on, you go on the roller coaster. Once again, it's a reflection on life. You get on the roller coaster, you enjoy yourself, and then you go into the uh, to the ghost train, which is the <laughs> the the other side of things, which is a little bit on the scary side. So once again, this song reflects um, Daniel's little journey. It's all his experiences that he had in the book. Uh, Chelsea Girls. That one was. A little difficult for me to to describe but it's almost like you're going you're ready to go to the pub or something yeah <laughs> <laughs> well chelsea girls is um once again reflects uh, daniel's experience with, with, with that chelsea girls which he could never pull so he used to go to these places um in chelsea and they used to regard him with scant regard basically they <laughs> because he, he looked a bit scruffy they they he would he could never actually pull them although he was very very interested in that um that's daniel in the book so chelsea girls is just a song about them these aloof fine creatures that are just out of his reach um that um that he is very desirous of but can't actually get to um and he 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 refers to them as being uh uh birds in a gilded cage mm. But at the same time, birds in a gilded cage that want to be free, want to be set free. And then you get in, in the in the in the song, you get that kind of very, very psychedelic section uh, as as the birds are set free. And you have a, and it disappears off into the distance. I got real excited about the next one because it's called Mods and Rockers. Right. <laughs> that, that quadrophenia kind of feel yes. to it. But uh it's it's like you're bouncing back and forth between the two. 
you know, you got the mods, you got the rockers that want going to rumble, but you're you're going back and forth to each one's perspective. Well, yeah, it is a bit of a, a bit of a nod to the Who, um, definitely, and, uh, and because I, I, I don't think you had it in America, but in in England during the late sixties there was always fights between the mods. Did you have mods in America? I can't remember. I don't know if I, you did. They, they're uh, not mods and rockers. You had um, you had like more of the, uh, the, the well, you had rockers, more like not shallow to explain. When the the '60s was around, you had the, the the guys that liked the rock music, and then you had the hippies, and yeah. kind of the same thing in the '70s. As the, the years progressed, I mean, you had the the metalheads back in the '80s, and then right. you know you had the new wavers and that kind of thing. That was more of what we were into. We had a very, very uh, specific uh, group of people. The mods would used to dress in suits and very, and very smart. And they would ride, you know, as, as in Quadrophenia, they would uh, drive, ride Vespers, whereas the rockers would be in their leathers, uh, crash helmets, and would, would ride uh, motorbikes. And every bank holiday in the summer, um, there would be riots and fights because they'd all go down to the south coast or they'd go down to Brighton or South End and they they just have running battles all the way through the, the bank holidays. So this this was a this song is about those running battles between the mods and the rockers. Um, it's, it purely is a, it's a bit of fun really um, and, and also a, a, quite a strong nod to the um, to the who to be quite honest <laughs> who, who I'm very fond of. I'll have to say that it did feel in one part of the song that you were on a, a scooter. And I, I, I don't know if that was what you were going for, but that's what it seemed like. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. I didn't have a scooter. I actually had a motorbike, actually. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you still put all the the uh, the uh, mirrors no, on? No, 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 no. That, that, that was, <laughs> that was that, a that Vespa was, thing. That, that was the mods, yeah. <laughs> that was a strange thing. But I suppose in America you 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 were aware of all that that kind of strange culture we, that was going on in England at that time. Oh yeah, a lot of the stuff that that we did was stuff we got from Europe, right? You know, the, the fashion and you know the music, especially the music. I mean, when we had the British invasion, I mean, look look at all the bands that came came in. over, right? Yeah, and and then you spawned off bands here that tried to get into that sound and, and, and it look what it evolved evolved to yeah well it was um america was uh was, was a great place to play that's for sure um because you know they you welcomed us with open hearts really um but on the hand you know the other hand you had some fantastic bands yourselves I mean, <laughs> we had a, we had an american invasion going the other way <laughs> well, Canada had some great bands as well. I mean, you had right. guess, guess Who and... Well, the guess Who, of course. Yeah. The guess yeah. Who, American Girl. Is that right? American Girl? American Woman. American Woman. American Woman. Love mm -hmm. that track. Yeah. That, I always get confused. When I hear that track, I always think it was um, uh, Randy California playing the guitar because it's got his same singing style. Mm. But I don't think it is. So no. I had this conversation with somebody else. Yeah, you had uh, Randy Bachman and... Uh, oh, you had Randy Bachman, that's right. Same name, but <laughs> same first name anyway. Right, right. Um, it, the, the music from then, was it had, had meaning to it, it had feeling to it. And when you get into the, the economics of everything, that you got corporations that step in and before you know it, it everything sounds the same. There's yeah. no true feeling to it. And believe me, there are some bands that really had talent, but when they, they had their record companies telling them, Oh, you got to sound like this. You got to, yeah. you know, look what it did to, to heavy metal music. Everybody had to have a ballad on their their album and you know you have to stick to this form it ruined the music right and now i'm starting to see a resurgence of a lot of that from that time 
um, the seventies, what that's when I grew up was the seventies. I guess that's why I love seventies music so much. Yeah. And, um, that the progressive rock that we got from bands like yours, like Emerson, Lake and Palmer, and I can King name Crimson. Them. Yeah, King Crimson. Oh yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, there's so yeah. many that had some real talent to it. And anybody today, if you're really into music or music, then you will really love this album. I'll have to say that there's bands that, you know, somebody from the band will leave and try to do their own album or they'll start another band. I'm always reluctant when, <laughs> when they come out because I hear some of it just doesn't sound as good as when they were with the original band. And I have to be kind of convinced of the of the music. Didn't have to convince me at all. As soon as that first track hit, I'm like, wow, this is cool. And then I listened to the whole thing. And I'm like, oh, yeah, <laughs> lovely. this is something oh, wow. I could play at a party and enjoy, you know. <laughs> oh, that's so nice to hear. Uh, it's so nice to hear. I was just, just going back to, um, to, to the American bands. Uh, you know, you... It, it, in England, we had prog rock, and in America, you had psychedelic rock, mm -hmm. and you had bands like Spirit. I don't, do you do you remember Spirit? Oh, I remember Spirit. Yeah, yes. I mean, we were we were very much influenced by Spirit ourselves. Uh, in in Curved Air, um, they seem to be kind of like breaking new ground, and also, it, you know, that they would they. They had a, this experimental feel about them, um, which was a bit more jazzy, I think, than than actually classical music. Um, but they had that. It, it just sounded like so. It sounded so fresh. It sounded organic. It sounded like it just arrived. It was not um, what's the word uh, fussed over or uh, there's, there's a word I'm looking for. I can't think of it. it wasn't contrived. Their music wasn't contrived. It was just it just came out. Mm -hmm. And they wrote, and they were writing really good um, echo warrior, eco warrior songs back in the you know the, the, the late sixties, singing about pollution and all that stuff, um, mm -hmm. stuff that way before you know became fashionable to do so. Uh, they were uh, you know they were very very big influences influence on us, and that was the band spirit. Mm. Well, the music back then, y'all took chances. And yes. it paid off. It did pay off because we've and, we've got that wonderful stuff to listen to. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I love Doctor Sidonicus, um, the, 12, the Twelve Dreams of Doctor Sidonicus by Spirit. That was well, a wonderful album. Well, you had uh, was it? Uh, oh gosh, I can't think of his first name, but uh, Greenbaum, and uh, was Norman Greenbaum. That's who Norman Greenbaum, yeah. right? I mean, nobody was doing what he was doing. Yeah, I go probably sit here and talk about it all day long. Okay. But there were so many bands that they took chances, and, and not only did it work, but it also spawned other genres of music and, and other great bands. But nowadays, there's they don't take any chances. No, no chances. And that's why no, it's it's, it's it. gone back to the it's gone back to the exec, execs. You know, the executives are running the business, and it's the suits that are running the business. Um, the Beatles broke that mold in 1967, or just before that, really. Um, they they took away control of the record companies about the content of the albums because they were in control of the content. It, the, the record companies couldn't dictate to the Beatles because they were writing hits one after the other, mm -hmm. one hit after another, so that they couldn't tell the Beatles what to write. So they became completely in control of their content. And that's when music just basically took off, when the rock music took off, because it gave everybody that idea that they could be, they could create their own music, and it gave them that freedom to do so. Um, but it didn't last long. It didn't, you know, back in the early 70s, 73, 74, 75, 76, 75 maybe, the, the record companies wrested it back into their control. And it wasn't until, I suppose, punk, when then it they had an, an attempt to you know bring the content uh, back to their control, uh, which but unfortunately for me punk was a bit destructive as opposed to being creative. <laughs> but you know it was it was a good thing to do I think it was a good you know a good thing to do just to to stop that insipid 
um, um, insipid type of music that was be beginning to become the norm. But as you say now, it, that it, it, it is the norm. Um, and it's it's purely controlled by the executives. That's, I'm only guessing this. I've got no idea. I mean, if that's true. But it would be nice to to, to hear some um, more experimental and, and more forward thinking musicians getting a bit of the limelight. Well, you know, the '50s when uh, rock kind of just started, rock and roll. Uh, there was, uh, you know, the, the taking a chance when you had, you know, Elvis and all these guys, but then it started to become formulaic. And then you noticed that, uh, the, the, like in the coffee shops, you, you had the, the uh, you had people like Bob Dylan and Pete Seeger. Right. And then a few, you know, here they come in, they're, they're doing more like protests or open your eyes kind of stuff. And then that evolved into what we know of the 60s music. You, you had the psychedelic yeah. stuff and more rocked up versions of Bob Dylan and what have you. And, and they were taking chances again. The 70s come in, you started getting more of a heavier sound. That was different. But then here comes disco, and then all of a sudden, oh, disco, yeah. yeah, that became the corporate formula. That's what was selling, and yeah, I think it took uh, hard rock to to really start changing things again. But once again, it went back to the same old formula. Yeah, you know the genres changed. People want to make money. You see, they won't take the risk. Yeah, <laughs> you had somebody that took a chance, and they made it work. They said, "Oh, we, we can make that same sound, but then you got it sounded the, everything the same." That's what I I can't stand. Prog rock. I mean, you, you guys were doing what you wanted to do. Oh, I know. You know <laughs> what I, a lovely time to live in. I was so lucky. Uh, exactly. Yeah, it was. I, I absolutely love Frank Zappa. He's one of my favorite artists of all time. Yeah, me think, too. I don't think anybody took as many chances as that guy did. No. <laughs> I met him. I met him once, actually. Did you? I bumped into him in the studio in London. Yeah. Um, I was delivering some parts to the drummer that he was using, a guy called Simon Phillips, and he was working with El Shanka. And um, you know, he, he, I just had a few words with him. You know, we just talked for a little while, but he was really, really nice, uh, really a gentleman, and um, just you know. So humble and easygoing. I, I heard he was a really easygoing guy, but when it came to the music, he uh, definitely put his fist down. He, yeah. <laughs> he was a little difficult at times. Well, well, yeah. But he was a perfectionist. He was a perfectionist, yeah, absolutely. He knew, he knew exactly what he wanted and it was going to be that way. And, I don't know how that guy was able to come up with as many songs that he did, but he filled up album after album after album. And there's not one Frank Zappa album that I can't sit and enjoy. Yeah. Well, Peaches and Regalia is one of my favorite tracks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's just lovely. <laughs> yes. It's a gorgeous track, that is. <laughs> well, it's hard for me to pick my favorite, but I can name off probably a hundred different songs. Yeah. I I really hope that things change, that people are looking for something different, something that, that uh, you're not normally going to hear. And it, there's people out there that do enjoy music for what it is. And I'm, I highly, highly recommend this album. And it's well, that's wonderful. Not, not that I'm just trying to kiss up to, to Mr. Way here, but it is really a good album. Oh, great, great, great. Yeah. Well, we tried our we tried our best to, to make it as good as we possibly could. And of course it's a, it's a recreation of, of, of the album that, uh, that that is featured in the novel. Um, and I can't tell you more than that because as I say, there's, there's, there's quite a big story connected with, with the album in the book. Right. What, what was the author's name? The author, the author is called Charles Shawwell. Hmm. Charles Shawwell. Um, he's a, an old friend of mine, and uh, funnily enough, he ended up living in the same area as, as, I, as I did. 
um, because we first met in London, then he ended up moving down to the southwest where I live. And, um, you know, we, we, we got together and we thought this, we, maybe we could do something together, you know, put a novel together with some music. And uh, so the idea was born. This, I rock guess this, progress. I guess this is your version of a rock opera in a way. Um, not really. It's, it's, it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a concept. Definitely. It's a concept because it's the concept of the album and the novel. That's, the most important thing. Um, it's not a thing that's been done too many times before. And I think maybe, um, I think the only person I can think of has done it recently was, was Dolly Parton, who um, did an album and a novel, but says once again, somebody else wrote the novel. Um, but it seems to me, if you're going to have a novel about the, uh, the music scene in the 60s, you've got to have a, an album that goes with it. It seemed to be like a no brainer. To, you know, to put the two together. So when you read the book and you hear the album, you, you know what the person was going through and, and the creative process that you went through to come up with all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And it, it makes each slightly more poignant, and poignant than they are on their own. They, the sum of the two parts is greater than their... The, 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 the sum of the two parts is greater than their individual parts. Something like that. <laughs> I can't remember the exact expression. That's a bit of a senior moment there. I'll think of it when I'm a bit, bit later anyway. If you're like me, I'll think about what I wanted to say at two o'clock in the morning. Yeah, why didn't I say that? Why didn't I say that? Oh, yeah, all the time, all the time. Now, you're an Brilliant. artist too, right? Artist? Mm -hmm. Um. No, I'm not an artist. No. Oh no, I I thought I read in there that uh, you did some artwork for it. Um, yeah, I did the artwork. Yeah, but I'm not an artist. I'm I'm, I'm just a a layup artist. I I have ideas, but I the you know I've, I've been doing um my own covers for quite a few years now, and I enjoy the process. It's it's a nice um what's the word um it's a it's a different process from the musical process and it's i find the artwork quite relaxing most i find music quite a tense procedure because i have exactly very big ideas of what i want to do um whereas the art side of making creating a, an album cover is i find very enjoyable very a very enjoyable process uh, i'm going to ask you something kind of personal here but uh, what's been the biggest hurdle in your whole career that you had to overcome? Overcome, ah, oh, wow. I would say um, stage fright, nerves. Um, that's been my biggest uh, problem. Um, yeah, it, especially when, if I'm performing classical music, I, I get very, very, very nervous. So that is, uh, my biggest problem is definitely is, is nerves. I'm, I'm not so bad with rock music, although I can, I can get nervous even then when I'm playing rock music. But uh, when I do classical performances, which I do occasionally or I have done occasionally, I don't do anymore. Um, I, you know, I suffer from very bad nerves, which stops me from playing to my best, which which I find very annoying. <laughs> I can <It's>, only imagine. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, that's 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 been my biggest hurdle is nerves. But you, know, you, you get through them. People manage to get through them somehow. Uh, I think most performers suffer from some sort of nerves. Um, it, it's how you manage them and how you get through it. But at the end of the day, you know, you've got to be um, you've got to be on top of it. And if if you, if you do a nerve effective pro, uh, nerve effective performance, it can be it can have a terrible effect on you. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I did a, I, I did a, a favor for somebody, a friend of mine. I played a, 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 some folk music with him, and I practiced all these folk songs with him. You know, practiced on my own, and I practiced it, practiced it with him because I thought it was just going to be in a in a pub somewhere, you know, just just for a bit of fun. And then we ended up we ended up playing in this very formal, uh, a formal uh, little hall with people sitting in seats. And I thought, hell, this is not what I was thinking it was going to be. And I literally forgot practically every single tune that I'd learned. Oh, it just, no. 
it just went straight up and I could half the performance I couldn't play because I couldn't remember it because it suddenly uh, the occasion was just too big although it was only a, it wasn't a massive occasion but for me I was thinking it was just going to be sitting in a pub playing a few tunes fine but it wasn't and um as I say I forgot I forgot it I forgot practically half of what I was meant to be playing so that's how bad it can be mm. just went straight out <laughs> so outside of music what would you say is your next greatest passion next greatest passion um wow that's of music Great passion. oh definitely the theater the theater um but i haven't been doing much of it recently but um but i, I used to be uh in the 70s and 80s 90s i was a great fan of uh, what, it, we, what we have in this, in this country is called fringe theater i think you have it in, in, in america too fringe theater it's like off broadway mm -hmm. it's more kind of cutting edge theater um it's not it's not musicals it's not um uh, west end productions it's just people putting stuff together cutting edge stuff and that and that was that was always my passion was um was the theater mm. You ever think about getting into doing some acting yourself? No, not acting. No, um, but I did. Um, I did write an opera that was uh, put on um, in the West End, not in the West End, just off the West End, and uh, in '96, um, and that was a very enjoyable experience because I was working with singers and, and actors and dancers. Um, so yes, I mean, I, that, that, I, other than music, I would say the theatre was my was my other passion is that what helps you relax when you want to kind of get away from things yeah but not so much now because um unfortunately i don't live anywhere near london so uh yeah. but that was when i was living in the london area I, that would be what, what i would do um now i suppose I, I, I how i relax is i watch comedy on television <laughs> <laughs> well, my favorite comedy out of uh, europe would have to be monty python and benny hill <laughs> oh, absolutely which one was the last one you said uh, benny Monty hill benny hill <laughs> benny hill right okay <laughs> yeah no, that's fun although my grandparents used to watch this one show the the people worked in a hotel i believed and there was one lady that worked i think behind the desk and she always had a different colored wig on i love right. that show i can't but i can't remember the name of it i, can't, I don't know oh i know um that was um are you being served that's it exactly oh, served yeah that's <laughs> I knew right once you said it i i know what you're talking about <laughs> well there's there's a, there's a couple of shows that we, we we've been watching re recently there's one from canada which is called the trailer park boys i love i like that too trailer park boys and we absolutely love that and and the american office was fantastic i've really liked both versions of it i've, I've yeah. watched uh yeah i've watched the the uk version all the both way both versions twice. are good yeah. yeah yeah fantastic <laughs> no, nothing beats the comedy if that's like the greatest tv show ever made the office yeah <laughs> wonderful isn't it i'm looking forward to this uh, it comes out on the 23rd of this month it does yeah okay both and, the album and the novel come out on the 23rd and you can get it on kindle or the novel on kindle and uh what else uh, you can get the novel on Kindle and on Apple uh, Books, and also you can get the album on iTunes and Amazon. Um, you can get hard copy, you can get uh, the CD on Amazon, and you get the digital version on iTunes. And there will be also a hard copy of the book uh, available uh, very soon. And what about your website? My website is darrellway.com. And are you on social media? We don't do so. No, I don't do social media, but um, I, you know, my management company to do, which is QEDG management. They do. Um, but I personally don't do, do social media, I, I but um, I, you know, Billy does and uh, my management do. So they, they, they're handling that side of things. Yeah. I don't blame you at all. If, if it weren't for having to promote the show, I probably wouldn't be on social media myself. All oh, right. <laughs> this Is has it... been an absolute joy. Um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming on the show. 
Well, you're, you're absolutely welcome. I've enjoyed it too. It's good old chewing the fat on, on, the, on, on the problems of modern music. <laughs> well, anytime you want to come on, you're more than welcome to come back. If you want to promote anything else, please let me know. I'd love to help. That's great, Carl. Uh, nice, very nice speaking to you. I'm really pleased you like the album. And I'm telling you out there, when this comes out, you need to get it. Uh, what was the name of the album? The Rock Artist's Progress. And it's the same name as the, uh, as the novel, The Rock Artist's Progress. Keep that in mind, folks. As soon as it comes out, you need to get it. This was really great uh, listening. I can't say enough good about it. I've, I've had people on the show that their albums are, are okay. But this was really a great album. So, <laughs> and uh, I appreciate you coming on, Daryl. All you out there, if you happen by the channel and this is your first time, thank you for stopping by. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. And please subscribe. And also, my appreciation to my regulars, it's because of you that I get to do this. So, until the next one. Everyone, please take care. Be kind to one another. God bless and peace. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Listen to the Vibes. You can catch us on Buzzsprout or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook at The Vibes Broadcast Network.